The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening. This is uh, Dr. Mike Schuster at the Schuster Center, and I'm really happy that uh, you've taken the time out of your schedules to just really uh, get into what the science of creating wealth is all about. And this is the first of a series of six webinars, and they're all intricately related, one with the other. So uh, I hope you're rested. I hope you're relaxed. I hope you're in a good place uh, so that we're able to, you know, spend this good time together and uh, really focus on where, where you're headed for your future. The first step in creating wealth is really to prepare your mind. So this is really what uh, today is about. I'm really going to focus on the first step, which is really getting your mind ready to receive it. Uh, and I'm also going to give you some key things to do uh, and key things to begin to do each time you, uh, after each one of our uh, sessions together. This goes all the way back to 1974 when I had uh, a first study club of dentists that I ever put together in Minneapolis at the request of, of Jim Trask. And there were 11 dentists, and within seven years, all of those dentists had become millionaires. And they used the exact uh, strategies and tools that I'm going to be sharing with you today and in the next uh, four or five months as you begin to build your own strategies and tools for creating wealth. Have to remember uh, that there are a few fundamentals and so I'm going to walk through some of the fundamentals with you but there are only a few things that will enable you to make most of the difference in the outcome of your entire life. So the fundamentals of creating wealth or creating any great life are Number one, and first and foremost, your mindset. The second is desire, because what I've found, unless people are motivated, unless they have a strong desire, any and all information isn't going to make any difference whatsoever. There has to be a reason why only 5% of all dentists ever can afford to retire. The third and uh, equally important fundamental is goals and plans. We're going to spend significant time on that. The fourth is faith. The fifth is self-suggestion, auto-suggestion, or uh, programming. You actually programming your own subconscious mind through the way you talk to yourself and through the thoughts you have on an everyday basis. The next is creative vis visualization. And we're going to spend a great deal of time on that as we walk through our process in the next months together and discipline and commitment. Without a strong commitment to what it is that you want to create in your life, it's highly unlikely that you will. And the last is in some way uh, being of service to others or creating value. If you aren't creating value, there is just no way that you're going to be able to create wealth in your life. So wealth is also directly related to your happiness and your peace of mind. It's a way of thinking. It's the way you organize your thoughts and your actions into a path or a style of living. It's the happiness and peace of mind is living your, with your values and having them in balance. So again, what we say, or what I like to say to people is happiness is activity with a purpose. And it's also a sense of order together with freedom. So maybe one of the first questions we should ask is, why should anyone want to create wealth in the first place? Well, as I think about it, it there's a certain satisfaction that goes with the creation, working to create wealth in your life. There's peace of mind. Uh, you know uh, you're relaxed because you know you have your plan, you know you're working on it, you know daily you're programming your mind to achieve it, and there's fulfillment. Uh, the fulfillment is uh, a positive attribute as well, and your life begins to make sense. You're actually orchestrating and ordering and organizing your own life to the definite end of creating wealth, but in the process you understand 
completely that you have to create value in other people's lives to do it. So in reality, this is biology. This is not an opinion. It's also a major of major importance uh, is the shift to an abundance kind of thinking rather than uh, scarcity or poverty sort of mentality. There's a great book written by Timothy Miller uh, entitled How to Want What You Have. And in that book he says, unless you uh, want what you have, how do you know you're going to be happy with more? It's also, and I'm going to spend more time with this, it's living above the line, which is above the line is in creating, it's in aspiration, Below the line is in survival, it's in security, it's in scarcity, it's in competition, it's in not enough. And life above the line is far different than simply reacting to what happens below the line. So it's spending your time aspiring and creating rather than simply reacting to what you have. So what is wealth? That's a great question. Uh, it, it's a, a controversial and word, and it often brings to mind a wide variety of thoughts and images. And often these uh, images are conflicting emotions. Every one of us has a different perspective of what wealth is. For one person, wealth means a lot of money. For another, it means freedom to go and do uh, what you want, where you want. For another, it means no debt. For another, it means to live abundantly. And yet, for others, it means the ability to grow, to evolve, and to become a complete and full and alive human being. Uh, I've got to compliment you all because most people don't stop and really spend any amount of time thinking about how they've arrived at what money and wealth means to them, uh, they've just more or less accepted their own viewpoint about it. They don't think about it. Most people I meet, uh, wealth means something more than just money and economics. It means that they have more than enough of something rather than not enough of something. I have friends without a great deal of money, but they're wealthy in their relationship to their family and friends. Others have wealth, that is, they have a, abundant knowledge. My parents were in this category. However, for the purposes of our time and our sessions together, I'm going to focus on the kind of wealth that brings financial freedom, time freedom, relationship freedom, and purpose freedom. That's the kind of wealth that comes from the conversion of energy and value in some sort of organizational setting in which energy and value are exchanged for money. For each of us, there has to be a specific amount of money which will make us feel abundant with regards to money and therefore financially free or wealthy. Most people I talk with on this subject, financial freedom or financial wealth has some sort of a dream regarding money. To be free to do what I want is what many people say. To be free to make my own choices. To go where I want. To do what I want. To associate with whom I want. To worship as I want. The clearer you become about what material wealth means to you and why, the more beneficial the ideas, theories, and strategies that I'm going to present to this in this series will mean to you. So. I'd like to ask you a few questions. You might want to write them down. Who of you wants to be average? Who of you wants to live a mediocre sort of life? Who of you realize that you're writing and living your own story right now? I thought as I was preparing this for you, what would, what would you want written on your tombstone? Here lies whoever. 
He was an average guy or average gal in every way. He lived a quiet, sort of mundane life. Never tried to do anything outstanding or be outstanding at anything. He was satisfied just to go to work. Never went the extra mile for anybody. He never really lived fully and completely. He never really dedicated himself or herself to anything beyond himself. He always followed the crowd. He never cared enough about himself or what he did with his life that he took it seriously enough to become an exceptional person and professional. He was satisfied to just get by. But as the years slipped away, he realized that he'd never developed his God-given potential. Not because he couldn't, but because he wouldn't. So, here's what I would like to say as we begin spending some time together. And I'd say for God's sakes and your own, don't let anything like this be written on your tombstone. I've often felt lately that many of the people that I talk to on the phone and visit with when I do seminars think that there's they're going to be reincarnated again because they're wasting the life that they have right now. You're only going to live one life, so you might as well live it to the fullest. You might, you're going to find that the journey is a lot shorter than you think. So don't waste your life. Get control of the forces that dominate your life and become the best human being that you can. So who of you realizes that it's the journey of life how we live each day, how we feel every morning and night that determines the real success or failure of our lives. A few small thoughts and habits practiced every day determine your success. So how does your operating system work? It works like this. What you think determines how you feel which impacts what you see, which determines what you choose, which determines what you do, and which creates what you have. Said in reverse, whatever I have or you have has been created by some action, we've done something, which has been determined by some choice which we made, which was impacted by what we saw, which was influenced by what you felt, which was determined by what you thought. Another way to put this is the control model by the Bennett brothers, which I've adapted a little bit. It goes to, it's a five-step model, and it says, what do you need? Now, needs would be, we'll talk about this later, but needs are your, your biologic needs, your basic needs as a human being, and, of course, your wants. And we all know that we all have needs or wants. And we have a certain set of beliefs. <laughs> now, these beliefs are our thought process. If anything determines the course of your life and whether or not you will create wealth in your life or not, in any form, it is what you believe. It is what your mind is telling you. The second set of ideas are really principles. So this really is not about beliefs or opinions. It's about principles. So if your beliefs or my beliefs are founded in principles, you can't fail to lose. You can only win. Because what happens when we establish a set of beliefs about the world or beliefs about anything, and in this case, it's a beliefs about how to create wealth, we establish a certain set of rules, regulations, and guidelines. Most of these we aren't even aware of. And those rules, regulations, and guidelines, which we I refer to as structure, determines your behavior. And behavior always determines results. So you start over here and you say, you outline what do you need and what do you want, 
And you get over to the other side and you have to ask yourself, did I really, am I really getting what I said I wanted? Peter Senye at MIT suggested that structure, which is the rules, regulations, and guidelines, determines patterns of behavior, and patterns of behavior determine results. The structures that we get, that we create in our life, consciously or unconsciously, come from our mindset or beliefs. So this is where we're going to spend a lot of today. We all have a set of assumptions, and from our assumptions, we develop a perspective or a worldview. In other words, everybody has a philosophy. A philosophy is a deeply held set of beliefs, values, or principles that guide your day-to-day -day life. So I really want you to understand that this is not opinion, but it's biology. Both poverty, that is failure, and wealth or success are the offspring of thought. What happens to us is the following. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about living below the line versus a living above the line. So a lot of times we refer to, in casual conversations, we talk about living below the line or above the line. Below the line is are people that are literally totally disabled. They, they are emotionally totally disabled. Then the next group is dis in disabling. They can function, but they don't function well. Mostly people that live below the line are living out of fear, scarcity, there's not enough competition, They always need more because they've never decided how much is enough. Once people get to a certain state above the line, they're living more or less in an enabling state. Now, to live in an emotional enabling state requires us to do a lot of mental work. It comes for some people a little bit more naturally than others. Living below the line comes for some people a little bit more naturally than others. We've all been around people or met people that you felt uh, really lived underneath a black cloud. In fact, they not only lived underneath a black cloud, there was a thunderstorm in their lives at all times. These people really create the state in which they live. We, in fact, we all create the emotional state the feeling state in which we live. So thoughts are really things. And they're, when they're mixed with definite purpose and desire, persistence and faith, they are always translated into wealth or abundance or other material objects. In other words, every thought in time is transmuted, transformed into its physical equivalent. This is not, and I want to remind you, I'm going to remind you three or four times, this is not about tidbits of information. This is an entire system in which you must engage yourself with all strategies to create wealth. If you don't work on your mind and prepare your mind, it is going to be an impossibility for you, in spite of taking in 20 to $40 million in your lifetime, to create wealth. Whether you learn it, practice it, or not, will determine the success or failure of your life and practice, period. One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when you're facing a temporary defeat. And you, we need to remember, on the other side of fear is always freedom. In other words, whatever we fear is what we really have to break through because it is the fear that always holds us back and keeps us from doing what we know we need to do. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. All really successful people that I've met, I've never met any really successful person that hasn't turned some failure into success. 
In fact, I would say the larger the failure, generally the larger the success. So people that look to just get by through their lives without enduring any discomfort, without going through uh, the, the, any pain, never really amount to much. They lay on the sidelines. They never take the risks. They never uh, make, take the trouble to really work at getting through the pain. So what you need to know and you need to realize is that you must create a state of mind that will enable you to create wealth. Your state of mind has more to do with whether you create wealth than all the education and all the intelligence that in the world. The purpose of this seminar is to help you learn the art of changing your mind from a scarcity consciousness to an abundance consciousness. I rarely meet, I rarely meet I rarely meet a dentist with an abundance consciousness. I talked to a dentist the day before yesterday who has a six and a half million dollar net worth and yet he'll be happy if he gets another five hundred thousand dollars in his pension plan. He's still living in scarcity. See, so the amount of money that someone has has nothing to do with whether they are living in poverty or scarcity or abundance mentality. I think it's amazing that he hasn't lost it yet. Whenever you take an import, undertake an important project or goal, you need to remember that you're probably going to begin what you need to do to achieve it or know that you don't have all the components you need to succeed. In other words, you've got to start even though you don't know every step. If you think you have to know every step before you begin, I'm going to promise you, you're never going to begin. So I'm outlining for you the process of creating wealth. And the first and most important step is to get your mind ready to receive it. And we do need to comprehend what my definition of creating is. Um, there are other definitions of it, but I believe creating is bringing something into existence that didn't exist before, at least for you. So we're looking at what other people have used to create wealth and freedom in their life, and we're bringing it forward into an organized system. We have to remember that the principles aren't my invention but I assemble them into a reliable, predictable system that works for any person who is serious and determined. And the, what needs to be underlined is the serious and determined because it's not going to happen by accident. So I want to remind you again that this is an entire system, not just a collection of random thoughts, tools that you can cherry pick here or there, uh, and think that you're going to put it together into a system on your own. You're not. Desire is the second most important part of all achievement. If you're not motivated, if you don't want it, it's not going to happen. Desire has to be transformed into a specific purpose, and it's more than simply goal setting. Desire is the energy you need to achieve your overall career or life objective. Your goals, then, are the specific steps along the way to achieve your purpose or life objective. So every, every person who creates wealth has to be willing to burn their past and cut off all sources of retreat. I was 37 years old and I had created a financial freedom for myself in seven years and I got ready to leave Dubuque and moved to Scottsdale to try to help other dentists do the same. I'd sold my house and my practice and my mom came into my office and she said this to me. She got dressed up with a beautiful pink dress and hat on, made an appointment to see me in my dental office and she came in and she said, well it seems to me you're leaving Michael, you've burnt all your bridges. And that's actually an exact thing that happened. You see, unless you can deal with your past and get beyond your past, 
you'll never be able to create the future that you want. My friend George Land says this, the pull of the future, that is the desire, the goals, the aspiration of what it is that you want to create, has to be greater than the gravity of the past. And if it's not greater than the gravity of the past, what you'll do is you won't do what I'm recommending that you do at the end of this uh, webinar. You won't do the first steps that are so important. You'll procrastinate your delay. You just won't have time to do it. Every person I've met that's old enough and experienced to appreciate how wealth has impacted their life or not, or the lack of it has impacted their life, wishes for it. But few are truly committed to do what it takes to create it. And that's why the group of dentists is 1% of dentists retire with more than $3, $3 million. 5-4% retire with 1 to 3, and the other 95% retire with less than a million dollars. So desire is transformed into wealth with practical strategies. So here are the things that you need to do. You need to write these down, and you need to do these now. Number one. Decide the exact amount of money you desire. Be definite about the exact amount. Number two, determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the wealth that you desire. In other words, you're going to need to determine exactly how you're going to create value in the lives of other people for what you intend to get, because there's no such thing as something for nothing. Number three, establish a definite date, a exact date, when you intend to create the amount of money you've determined is wealth for you. Remember, the amount is different for different people. So it has to be the exact amount of wealth for you the exact amount of money for you. Number four is you're going to need to create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and purpose and begin at once. Even if you don't know every step of your plan, you need to begin at once. Whether you believe you're ready or not, you have to start today. Number five, now write it all out. Write out a clear, concise statement about, of the exact amount of money you intend to create or generate. Name the time limit to do it exactly. And state exactly what you intend to give in return for the money. Write this out and then type it out. Or put it into your computer and do it in your computer. Then, describe completely and clearly what your plan is by which you will, you're going to create the wealth. And this is something that a lot of you are going to look at this and you're going to think that this is not important. This is the big deal. You're going to have to put this in your closet. I put it behind the mirror in my closet. And you need to read it every morning out loud and every night out loud. It's not enough to just read it. I want you to stand there. This is only going to take you 30 seconds, a minute. As you read it, you're going to have to begin to believe that you already have it. You've got to see yourself in possession of it. And you need to learn to act as if. This is a statement that was made by Mortimer Adler, and my dad gave me this statement when I was a young man. Act as if, and you will become it. You don't wait to hear to achieve your goal. You start today to do what's required to do today, to, to manifest the changes in yourself, in your behavior, in your thoughts that are going to allow you to receive it. 
So this is what the latest research, I mean, this is stuff that's coming out in, uh, in brain scans. The latest research on neurophysiology and neuropsychology has proven or revealed that your goals must be specific. Well, we know it, but people don't do it. They got to also be numeric, that you've got, you must perform the physical act of writing your goals on paper. By doing the, the physical act of writing your goals on paper, what you're doing is you're putting this into your neurophysiology. You're actually writing a print in your brain. You have to write it out. And it's also essential to repeat your stated goals often and aloud. Now, you might put this someplace in your office. I don't care where you put it, but it's something that you can't forget. With people that I work with in Performance Coach, I say, this needs to be on your, on your planners. And you need to put it there so you're reading it. You're, we're actually carrying this with us in our back pockets. So it's that close. It's incredibly important for you to call your imagination into action. You've got to see yourself as already having achieved your objective. Because you can't leave the creation of wealth to luck. So in order to have a dream come true, you've got to have a dream. It's Covey has said over and over again, everything is created at least twice. First it's in your mind, and then it's manifested in reality. But too often, people don't spend enough time really working to create it in their mind. You see, a dream without a desire is a wish. A dream with a burning desire or ambition is a certainty. It's an absolute certainty. A burning desire is always transformed into its physical or material equivalent. We've all heard this statement so many times. When the student is ready, the teacher always appears. But you notice that the teacher never appears until the student's ready. Most people spend their entire life looking for a teacher, but they've never ever decided what they want. So. We all have to keep in mind that there are no limitations to the mind except the limitations we accept. There are those that say they can and those that say they can't, and they're both right. Henry Ford. I remember uh, a motivational speaker in Scottsdale by the name of Joel Weldon. Uh, I met Joel about 25 years ago, and Joel's card was a little can, a little tiny, about a four-ounce can. And it had a label on it, and it said, success comes in cans, not cannots. It sounds simple, and maybe to some of you, you think this is trivial, because you're educated, you've had a lot of years of college education, but if you haven't done this, there's no sense getting an education. Faith, we're going to talk about faith because it's one of the absolute most important pieces of this entire system. Faith means that you have confidence, that you have trust, that you have absolute unwa unwavering belief that you can do something. If you have a nagging doubt in the back of your mind, which is always in your subconscious mind, or if you're just going through the motions of pretending to believe, it won't work because your subconscious mind will know your doubts. Your conscious mind receives information through the five senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. Your conscious mind and what you remember is the intelligence in which you normally think, reason, and plan. On the other hand, your unconscious mind has access to all the same information your conscious mind receives, but it doesn't reason right from wrong. The unconscious mind doesn't reason right from wrong. It doesn't make value judgments. It doesn't filter 
and it doesn't forget. Faith as a state of mind can be created by affirmation or repeated instructions to the subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion or, or self-suggestion, or today the more common term that I'll share with you later is creative visualization. The repetition of thoughts and sentences or affirmations is like giving orders to your subconscious mind. And it's the only, only known method of voluntary development of the emotion of faith. Absolute certainty that you can do something. This is overwhelmingly important. In fact, it is absolutely critical because your emotions or the feeling portions of your thoughts are what give your thoughts vitality, life, and action. If you don't get the emotional part engaged, you don't take action. The emotions of desire, faith, and love, when mixed together with any thought impulse, give it even greater energy for action. All thoughts have been emotionalized, given feeling. That, that means a thought is given feeling when the emotional component is attached to it. And when it's mixed with faith, that is absolute certainty in your ability to manifest it, it begins to immediately trans, translate itself or transform itself into the physical equivalent. I had a fascinating experience a couple of weeks ago. A dentist in Scottsdale who read my book, The Science of Creating Wealth, invited me to speak to a local group. Uh, so I accepted. And I met the dentist who invited me to speak before the seminar. And he, uh, so I said, what did you think of the book? He said, well, I could only read half of it. And I said, well, that's interesting. Well, why? He said, because it was too painful. Then he went on to tell me and say to me, uh, that since he read the book, he'd save $10,000 every month. And so I'm, I said to him, well, what's so painful about that? And he said to me, uh, what I have to sacrifice to get it. So what I want to tell you right now is he is going to reverse himself. He is going to do it and quit doing it because he hasn't emotionalized and given feeling with faith to what he wants to achieve or accomplish. He has not written down a specific amount. He's not written down what he's going to give to get it. He's not written down a date. He doesn't have a plan to do it. I absolutely guarantee you that if I see him in a year, he'll be exactly where he was when he began. A negative thought repeated often enough will also be transferred or transformed into its physical equivalent. It's another way of saying that there are no accidents. This is what amounts or accounts for millions of people who continually experience negative results and call it bad luck. No matter what happens in their life, no matter how good it is, they're always under the cloud. Your belief or faith is the element that will determine the influence of your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind will transform into its physical equivalent by the most direct and practical way possible any order that's given to it, be it positive or negative. Any order that's consistently given to it, positive or negative. So it's another way of saying, very simply, if you don't program your mind, somebody else will. If you don't take charge of the thoughts that you have, that you think about over and over, what will happen is you will program yourself into poverty, as the majority of people do, regardless of how much money they make. Faith is a state of mind that you create by auto-suggestion or self-talk. You create the faith.
It doesn't happen by accident. People aren't born with faith. Your thoughts can destroy your faith. Faith. So in order to do right, we've got to think right. You control your emotions by controlling your thoughts. We all, we all know that many times we get emotional about something and we say things we shouldn't say because we aren't controlling our emotions. Our emotions are controlling us. So it's another way of saying, unless we control our emotions by thought, our emotions will control you. There's no other way. There's no other reason. There's no other explanation about how, how and why good people die broke. How do good people continually make bad choices? They make bad choices because they allow their emotions to control their thoughts rather than their thoughts controlling their emotions. Faith is the divine elixir that gives life, power, and action to the impulse of thought. Faith is the starting point for all creation of all wealth. Without faith, absolute certainty that you can create it, it's highly unlikely that you will. Faith is the basis of all miracles and all mysteries that can't be analyzed by the rules of science. And I want to say, faith is the only antidote for failure. Sometimes in our lives, it's happened several times in mine, that other people actually had more faith in me than I did in myself. Example was my mother had more faith in me than I had in myself. And at a certain point in my life, Dr. Harold Wirth and Dr. L.D. Pankey had more faith in me than I had in myself. And they were able to bring me along. So faith is the element that mixed with the desire gives you direct communication with divine intelligence or God. It's the element that transforms thought created within the human mind to its spiritual equivalent and eventually into its physical equivalent. Faith is the only known way that the force of design intelligence can be harnessed and used. There is no other way. So I want to just share a couple thoughts about the magic of self-suggestion. It's a fact that you will become to believe whatever you repeat to yourself, as I will, whether the statement is true or false. If you repeat a lie over and over, you'll eventually accept it as a truth. You'll believe it as a truth, and you'll act on your lie as if it were a truth. Now, this could be true for an assumption that I could make. If I made an assumption about something and it was untrue, I could continue to tell myself that it was true and I could end up taking action on an assumption that would literally uh, ruin the rest of my life. I'm in conversation with a dentist right now who has a sizable practice and his partner is, is thinking about uh, leaving and selling him his practice which would be 5,400 patients for one dentist, and he's thinking about buying it. There's just no way in God's green earth that he can do it. But, and that decision, if he makes it, will destroy the next 15 years of his life. But, if he keeps telling himself over and over a lie about it or makes an assumption about it, eventually he's going to begin to believe it and then going to act on it as if it were true. So we really have to be careful. All of us have to be careful what we say to ourselves. So you are, as I am, what you are because of the dominating thoughts that you continue to repeat over and over in your mind. I've got in front of me one of the uh, most important books I've ever read, and I have to say I've read it over a thousand times. And the title of the book is A Man Thinketh. I would encourage you 
to get a copy of that book or pull one out of your library and read it and read it and read it and read it. Because it truly is, you will do what the dominating thoughts of your mind direct you to do. Now, what happens is that you are in control of your conscious mind. So your conscious thoughts have to program your unconscious mind. Because that's what's happening all day long, every day. Okay? Any idea, plan, or purpose can be placed in your mind through repetition of thought. If you choose, you can throw away any bad experiences of the past and build your own life the way you want it to be. For some people, this seems to be the greatest challenge that they face in their life. I would say for most people. We've all had bad experiences. We've all been taken by someone. We've all been lied to by someone. We've all been cheated by someone. We've all been betrayed by someone. If you haven't, you will be. It's very difficult. We have to continue to throw away bad experiences because if we don't, all we're going to do is repeat them. So today, as I said, or we call this self-suggestion or auto-suggestion, or creative visualization. So part of the self-confidence formula is that I know I have the ability to achieve the object of my primary purpose in life. I'm going to demand that I must be persistent, and that I take continuous action to its attainment, and I'm going to promise to take the action. I realize that the dominating thoughts of my mind will eventually reproduce themselves in outward physical action and will gradually be transformed into some physical or material reality. Therefore, I'm suggesting to you that every morning when you get up, like me, I want you to concentrate on your thoughts for 30 minutes each morning. I don't care if you exercise, if you take a walk, if you pray, if you meditate, if you sit alone in a chair and hum, if you listen to quiet music, but that's the time that you must take every day to really be conscious about visualizing the per person you want to become and be very, very conscious of the thoughts that you're having at that time so that you can get a very, very clear picture about uh, what's going on in your own mind. Because I know through the principle of auto-suggestion or self-suggestion that any desire I hold in my mind will eventually find some practical means of attaining it. Any desire I hold in my mind will eventually manifest itself in some form. I have a clearly written description of my definite life purpose, and I will never stop trying until I've developed su sufficient self-confidence for its attainment. I fully realize that no wealth or success can last unless it's built on truth and justice. If I lie, cheat, and steal from others to get it, if I manipulate people and misuse people and do harm to people to get it, I won't keep it. Therefore, I'm going to engage in no transaction with anyone at any time that does not benefit all to whom it affects. Behind this formula is the biologic law of nature that psychologists call auto-suggestion or self-suggestion, and now they call it creative visualization. It's the same thing with different words. The most important thing that I have to say to you is that the subconscious mind makes no distinction between constructive, positive thoughts or destructive or negative thought impulses. It does what it's instructed to do, and you are the instructor. The subconscious mind will translate 
into reality, a thought driven by fear, just as readily as it will translate into reality a thought driven by courage or faith. Remember, if you fill your mind with fear and doubt, and if you do not believe in your ability to connect with and use the forces of divine intelligence, you'll not be able to use any of these other forces. You'll always find yourself short. So faith is when you have faith in your abilities. Part of what you've got to have also is faith that it's possible to tap in to the divine intelligence. And because you have faith that it will work, your conscious mind won't resist you. Pay attention. Most people spend their entire life in a constant battle and struggle between their conscious mind and their subconscious mind because they have not taken the time and effort and energy to program their conscious mind. So they're always sitting in doubt. They're always wondering what will work or not. They're always waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for conclusive proof. So as I often say to people around the center, what do procrastinators do? They procrastinate. But you need to understand that if you procrastinate, it's because you're in a battle between your conscious and your subconscious mind. When your conscious mind doesn't resist, your subconscious mind can then send creative ideas to your conscious mind more easily. I've got a little saying out in the hallway that I just love on a, on a little character written by Brian Andres from Iowa, and it says, Life would be a lot easier if I could just get myself to agree with each other. Remember, it's the conscious mind that programs the unconscious mind. And then the unconscious mind eventually rules our life. Like the winds of the sea, the law of self-suggestion will lift you up or pull you down according to how you set your sails and thought. Faith is the strongest and most influential of all human emotions. Skepticism, in connection with new ideas, is characteristic of all human beings. If you follow the negative instructions, your belief will soon be replaced by skepticism. How many dentists do I meet that are loaded with skepticism? and they don't even know where it's coming from. And in time, the belief of skepticism will form into an absolute rock-hard belief, and so they never take any action, but they sit there and moan and complain and bitch and whine. So if you ever see anybody whining and complaining and bitching and moaning, uh, if it happens to be the person that you're looking in the mirror at, be sure that you understand, as I do, that it is the thoughts that I'm having in my conscious mind that are programming my own disbelief and skepticism. So you and I are always the masters of ourselves. Now, for many people, this is hard to hear. They don't want to hear that whatever success or failure they've had is because of them. People that are failing are always looking for an excuse or an alibi. But as we all know, success has no alibis. It has reasons. Remember this. We all suffer adversities of some kind in our life. Every failure, and people that have great failures often have great success. Every great failure and adversity and heartache always brings with it the seed of an equivalent equivalent or greater benefit. And I'm careful, however, not to confuse excellence with perfection. Excellence I can reach for, but perfection is God's business. So I want to wrap this up by giving you some things to work on, some instructions that I want you to work on in the next month to get yourself ready for our second session on the science of creating wealth. These are your instructions. 
I want you to pay close attention to your self-talk. I want you to pay close attention to what you say to yourself when you get down up in the morning. I want you to write down the thoughts that occur most in your mind. I want you to actually write them out so that you're able to look at them and see how many times you're thinking in this way. So I want you to pay attention each morning to the nature of your thoughts. Are they positive? Are they negative? I want you to pay attention in the need, evening to the nature of your thoughts. I want you to write out the exact amount of money you want to accumulate at an exact date. I expect that you're going to have that. Now, this is the amount of wealth for you. It isn't what somebody else tells you to do. Put this in the closet or someplace you can read it out loud every morning and every night. Remember to read the exact amount and the date out loud every morning and night. And if you want to go one better, put it in a card, on a card, and carry it with you in your wallet or someplace every day. Now, Barb has some questions. If people have questions, uh, I want to suggest that our next session, which is about a month from now, are, is going to be about key strategies that I've learned to help people overcome obstacles in their life. If any of you want to go to the website, pick up some more information at the website or whatever, or if you want to um, email me personally with any questions or issues that coming specifically from our uh, discussion in this webinar, please feel free to email me at my personal email at mike at c charlie f frank p papa d delta dot com. I'd like to thank you for taking the time. Uh, I tried to go through this slowly and not run through it. Uh, we've got a lot more ground to cover, but go to work on what we've started with today, and we'll build on it as we move forward. Thank you for taking the time, and I look forward to doing more work with you. Thank you. That concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us. And also thank you for answering the poll questions. Um, I did appreciate that. And uh, if you do have specific questions for Dr. Schuster, you may email him um, at his email address there. And again, thanks for joining. <laughs>